What's going on, guys? It's Brian Jack with Superman's Comics, and we are kicking off Christmas week with our last content video of the year. And it couldn't be a better one because we got that top 10 back issues. This is covering the whole year, though, right, Jack? Yeah, yeah. We're looking at the entire year. Um, and we're not just looking at like specific back issues um, that we feel like were like books of the year. We know there's going to be a lot of videos all over YouTube kind of highlighting those top 10 books of the year. Instead, we're doing what we do at Simple Men's Comics, and we're looking at kind of those overarching trends that were consistent um, this year. So think about this show as in three up, three down meets the top 10 back issue show. Yeah. Three up, 10 down, back issue all around. <laughs> but, and a merry, merry Christmas. So let's get into it right now, starting with number 10. First, I want to talk about we got that big resurgence this year, and we saw Spawn get a lot of attention, whether it was the movie news, the not movie news, the toys, the Todd McFarlane Kickstarter, but the comic itself, the series itself, the cover art, magnificent. Yeah, and you mentioned a lot of those like other things that kind of were talked about, stop, start, um, but really the, the new comic sales, to me, is the largest kind of win for Spawn. Yep. I mean, starting with the road to 300 even. Right, exactly, exactly, leading up into that. But a lot of times, I mean, how many times have we seen this, Brian? That's a gimmick, right? Like yep. a big issue. Um, you know, we saw it with Amazing Spider-Man. We've seen it with Batman, with uh, Joker. We've seen it with Action Comics and Detective Comics, you know, all these like landmark issues. And it's not like after the landmark issue, you, you kind of continue that heat. And Spawn has really ro rode that heat all the way up until like, 310 doing like 150,000 in sales. I mean, just a staggering, staggering number uh, for a series that if you like look at it throughout the life of the series, there's real ebbs and flows with the print run production. And it's all based on the demand that you guys out there in the comic book community have put on uh, this book. So Spawn has been back issue gold for a long time. For the last, I would say three or four years, we could say it's been real back issue gold. Flippers have been making great money. It's been one of those hush, hush, don't tell everybody uh, kind of, properties but um the word is out as the new comic book day numbers are really showing that spawn has really been a hit with the today's comic book buyer yeah and it's crazy to talk about staying power because there's a while there it seemed like every issue the solicit the cover would be shipped yes it wouldn't be oh the cover that they solicited and it gets so frustrating because you're like oh man then you go on new comic book day and it's not what not what you were expecting but either way people are still picking them up and people love some spawn and at number nine, we got a lot of Black Panther news. But on top of that, there was a lot of hype on Shiri this year, whether it was what, what steps you're going to take in the move, upcoming movie. We also heard that they aren't going to recast Black Panther. So we're going to find out what's going on there. But Shiri within the comic books is another one that was hot this year. Yeah, Shuri's popularity, unfortunately, hit the stratosphere uh, due to the uh, unfortunate and, and un, untimely death of Chadwick Boseman, which I think... We can all say um, if this was like a top 10 list of biggest things that happened in comics, I would think unquestionably the biggest thing that happened was the death of Chadwick Boseman this year. I mean, I don't think you can love comics and love these properties and these characters with, without feeling like a sense of loss. Like we talk about a right hook. I mean, no one's, it was like a total surprise too. Yeah, none of us saw it coming. Um, I remember when I was originally told the news from a family member I almost didn't believe it because it was one of those things I assumed was those like Facebook fake news things um, and then finding out it's real. But we've had to live in like a post Chadwick Boseman and in turn post T'Challa MCU. Um, now, I can't put it all on that for sure he's popularity because there was a lot of groundswell of popularity as going into 2021 for sure. As again, anybody who's read the comics knows that eventually um, T'Challa, uh, you know, meets his demise, ends up returning, but temporarily meets his demise and and it is Shuri who has to step in and take that mantle um and that anticipation has been very strong within the mcu as of course uh you know we've seen the actress uh dua lapita who plays shuri on film see her kind of like stock within hollywood rise with other roles like us um and and a number of other roles it continuing to kind of push her her stardom um, but now with with 
the Black Panther franchise moving forward, Black Panther 2 is coming. You mentioned at the Disney Investor Day call, Kevin Feige confirmed what we all figured, which is that Chadwick Boseman is irreplaceable as T'Challa. Uh, and so instead, it really leads us to believe that the fate of the Black Panther franchise less, rests largely on the shoulders of Shuri. Um, and this has really propelled her first appearances, whether or not we're talking about Shuri's first appearance in comics or we're talking about uh, Shuri's first appearance as Black Panther or first cover appearance in the Black Panther uniform. It really doesn't matter. All of these books have spiked to unreal levels in 2021 as everybody is anticipating 2021, 2022, Shuri as Black Panther. Coming in at number eight, that's a trend that's kind of volatile within comics. Some people like it, some people don't, but it's definitely one that we talked about a lot in 2020 and continue to do so. And those are those later printings. Yeah, I don't think we can talk about 2020 without referencing these late printings. Um, it, it really has been amazing. I think there's been good and bad on both sides. You and I have been advocates of these late printings. We thought for a long time they're very undervalued. Um, having said that, did people go overboard with it this year? Yeah, that tends to be what happens, though, when people miss out on a trend for so long. Um, I, I saw that this year with properties like uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that were properties that we're still going to talk about that you and I have been long uh uh advocates for where it's like when people jump in and they feel like they're behind there's always that like overcorrection and maybe we saw that in in second prints um it also the thing about second prints that are unique is people's desire for them comes from different places some people buy these second prints because of the uh the kind of like completionist nature of the character or run that they're buying um some are buying these these late prints for the just as variant covers the alternate cover art of a character or series or writer that they collect or enjoy um we're also seeing people buy them for like the first appearance that appears in that book and essentially getting a uh a second chance on a book that they maybe missed out on and then maybe some even some better cover art than the original cover and then we've seen kind of the most volatile area of this market which is the people who are just buying on pure scarcity um, and the fact that these books having such a minuscule print run in comparison to their first print counterpart of the same title has been a large reason for a lot of people to be able to kind of wrap their head around the popularity of second prints. Um, it, that's never been our favorite reason to buy them, but um, that has certainly been a, a market determining factor. Um, I don't know how long this last print craze is going to go. I will say, I think the day of later prints being like overlooked totally is gone. I don't think that'll happen again. Um, having said that, will they be kind of the toast of the town the way they have been throughout 2020 largely? I don't know. But one thing you're always going to get from this channel is you're going to get Brian and I reporting on the news, giving our opinions, but we're never going to hate on what other people are buying. So you guys have been out there buying these late prints in 2020, and we're going to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it before. I mean, I remember Edge of Spider Verse was one of the first ones, but yep. if I'm thinking about like this latest trend of where it picked up, I'd almost go back to probably that Thanos 13 with the Cosmic Ghost Riders, where mm -hmm. it seemed like those later printings, especially when Marvel started switching up the cover art rather than just the color change. We've talked about how much we hate the color change, but definitely a lot of people like later printings. In fact, we made it a whole segment in the Final Order Cutoff show where we talk about all the late printings that are heading Final Order Cutoff as well. Coming in at number seven, this is one that was great to see. It actually kind of started in 2019, but we are talking about creator-owned sales figures. Those numbers for those creator-owned titles continue to grow, especially with the resurgence of Image. We saw it happen with Boom. We're also seeing it with IDW as well. Yes, and you mentioned it. Uh, we started to see it in 2019, and we did. We saw some solid momentum with like um, Something's Killing the Children, Once in Future. Those were series that did big, big sales numbers. But those numbers that they did for their issue number ones pale in comparison to what say we only find them when they're dead and and um uh seven, seven secrets, secrets. yeah which aren't predominantly thought of in the secondary market to be um say the hits that the first two were now i will say granted there's a year difference you got to give another year i do think we'll be talking about seven secrets and we only find them when they're dead in that light um, but that's not, that's just like the beginning because you mentioned the key is image comics. Now we already talked about um, Spawn, who, whether people understand this or not, is, is a creator owned series. Um, and Spawn oh, into those six digits. Um, Department of Truth from James Tynan, six digit, 150,000 or something like that, issue number one debut. Um, 
crossover from Donny Cates, another 100,000 plus debut. The 1.7 million that Keanu Reeves Berserker did on Kickstarter just in trade paperback and hardcover form really indicates what we're going to get into in 2021 when that series launches. So what we're seeing is that creator-owned comics are no longer being looked at as like, say, a smaller niche within the comics community. Um, I think that the, the title of like indie books and these books being looked at as, you know, kind of like it, we love to make wrestling references here and the indies is the minor leagues, right? And, and, the, and the majors is you going to WWE or AEW. I think those days are gone. I think really we've proven that um, these creator-owned titles from these independent comic publishers can- Plus we all know NXT is better than Raw anyways. Exactly. And so in, in, in a lot of that vein, I think that's why we end up getting uh, creator-owned books that oftentimes are better than the big two books. If you look at the, the largest reader buzz in, in 2020 uh, for, for whatever series, I, I really think other than what maybe two writers are doing, in the entire big two comic market, I would say the majority of the reader buzz is truly coming from creator owned titles. Um, and, and that I think is positive for the industry because creator owned success feeds in to the big two system. Um, and it also allows for graduation from the big two system and for spots to open up for new creators. So it, it, it's, it's all positive and helps pro- proliferate the hobby. Yeah, plus you're also seeing that flip-flop of where you're seeing these creator-owned that, from authors that have written for the big two, but people know them from writing those creator-owned mm-hmm. stories now. They're like, oh, I liked it. He wrote this book. He's writing this this for Marvel or DC now. I'm going to pick it up because I like that, that author. Yeah, and we saw major announcements like Jeff Johns and Scott Snyder leaving the big two game to go creator-owned into 2021. I, I think this is a trend, Brian, we're probably going to be talking about next year as well. Then coming in at number six, this is no surprise to anyone, but we talked about it a lot on this channel and talked about it. It's been talked about all over, but Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles had one hell of a 2020. Yeah, we are getting to the point in the list where I have to say, you could take this top five and you can make an argument for anything in the top five to be sitting number one, um, hands down. Uh, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, certainly, this felt like the year of the turtles, largely. Uh, um, I think most of us spent some time in the sewers this year. Uh, and certainly, it's a place where Brian and I have lived for the last several years. We have um, long been advocates, not just of the reader buzz of the current series, but of the undervalued nature of the back issues due to the overall nostalgic factor and the fact that, unlike a lot of properties that struggled to have that second generation um, pick up and adopt them, um, that which is something that only a few of these properties have been able to do. Um, I think Ninja Turtles is the absolute leader in the clubhouse for how to do that. Uh, there is a almost a third generation of children now growing up with Ninja Turtles uh, in, in their household, becoming a part of their lives. And we've seen this now play out to, as we talk about people with money now buying books. So you're seeing record sales for TMNT number one. You're seeing some of the other trends play in like the late printing trend that we talked about already play into these Ninja Turtle stuff. We've seen the Jenica popularity. We've seen the reader buzz of issue number 100 going into the first appearance of like Lita and Mona Lisa with issue 101. Um, the, the weasels with 102, Zana, Zinc, and uh, a Mushroom, as well as 105, where you get that adult Lita, Alapex joining the Splinter Clan. Um, and then, going into the solicitation that's out right now for 113, where we're going to get the return of adult leader. On top of all of that, you've got Last Ronin, another book that did 175,000 in print for, again, a title that is a licensed property, but because it was done by the creators, was very much a creator-owned release. Um, And that book has been just widely successful. Everyone loves issue number one. Everybody is chomping into bit to get to issue number two. We're already soliciting a third print for issue number one. There was clearly a short sell. They had to release a thank you variant months later to try to make up to retailers for the allocation issues. Uh, you look at cover A going three times cover price when the book was eight ninety nine. Where do you see that? You see with no first appearance. You were just straight reader bus. Where do you see that? Um, and then and then. On top of it, every single exclusive that was created by any exclusive variant creator 
I would love to meet the variant creator who didn't make a profit on that book. Like and that book was just in such demand. Um, it, it was one of those ones that helped uh, kind of mitigate losses on other books this year. But that book is, is, is amazing. Um, everything Ninja Turtles was increasing in popularity. And Brian, there's still some things out there that I think are going to keep this on people's radar in 2021. There's a Seth Rogen animated movie coming. Um, there is a new live action television series coming. These are things that we have not seen. So like adult animated live action. These are, these are things that we want. These are things that people want to get involved in, as well as talks about an upcoming sequel feature film that will go back to the original trilogy and forego some of those disastrous movies all that have been made recently, albeit ones that were incredibly popular with children. So, which is always going to be the core audience for Ninja Turtles. So huge year for TMNT. And it's one I don't think is going gonna, is gonna to stop next year. But I also think, um, you know, kind of the rising tide lifts all ships. So the, the way that the Ninja Turtles have validated these licensed properties from the 80s and 90s, I would say watch out for Transformers, watch out for G.I. Joe, watch out for Masters of the Universe, watch out for Thundercats. Um, 2021, I think, will be a year where a lot of these properties are getting a, a increased attention. Yeah. Good old 80s. I love it. And that's at number five. This was when we talked about 2020. We've talked about in 2019. I know we're going to be talking about a lot more, especially as we get through 2021 and, and, and the sequel of that movie coming in 2022. But Miles Morales continues to be one of those hot topics, one of those hot characters. And one thing I like about it is I like all the periphery characters that come up from that Spider-Verse that all anchor to Miles Morales. Yeah, I mean, we could, we could argue who was the character of 2021. All right, and the character of 2020, you're talking null, you're talking punchline, um, and I think you're talking uh, Miles Morales. And to me, you just got to look at first appearance pricing and where the jump this year has gone um, to see that it's Miles Morales. And you mentioned all of these things, but like Edge of the Spider Verse or Into the Spider Verse came out a couple of years ago. You know, we're two years we're, ago. Yeah, we're removed from any real reason why 2020 was like a Miles Morales boom year, yep. other than the fact that people are seeing this trend coming. Um, we know that an, a, a Spider-Verse live action is coming. We know that more into the Spider-Verse movies are coming. Plus today's youth, I, I think, identifies more with Miles Morales than P Peter Parker. Absolutely, but even me, I sit back and, and as I really look at it and go, Peter Parker is supposed to be an example of the youth of New York. Um, and whether you want to talk racially or, or financially, uh, you know, Peter Parker is very much the New York of the 60s versus Miles Morales, who's very much the New York of today. And I think that that is, we, you and I talk about this, like you got to develop these stories. We can't just be stuck always generationally telling the same stories um, and expecting our kids' kids to love the exact same story that we got. Um, so I love the character development that is shown with the, the development of, of Miles Morales. And it, it's taken a while. People don't understand this. Like you're talking like this character was created what, like 15 years ago. And it's taken that long for this character to hit the level that it is. So I think that what Miles Morales really teaches me is patience. With some of these current. Which we've mentioned that with that other Bendis character that was recently created in Naomi. Exactly. Exactly. We've made that parallel with Naomi and, 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 and Miles Morales, but it's very hard, Brian, because you can't tell one of these new collectors what it felt like when Miles Morales was first. The, the backlash <laughs> to Miles Morales. How long we saw those first appearances sit in $5 boxes. And how many, and even as smart as guys like you and I are, how that affected the way that we looked at that book financially and the amount of times that we left that book sitting in boxes affordably over the years, which now looks beyond silly. Um, so my, really, that is, is, it's one of the books that has really shaped my long-term view on the comics industry in general, um, as well as the, the way that diversity plays in, into the, the game successfully, rather than through what a, people deem forced measures. Um, it just takes time. You have to have patience. And I certainly think Miles Morales is going to be a character going forward that is always going to be kind of a top five character. But in 2020, there is no doubt. Miles Morales made his mark on the comic industry, maybe more than any other character, probably more than any other character that I can think of. Yeah. 
And, and am I saying Naomi's going to be the next Miles Morales? I'm not. But I'm also not going to sit there and spend the $3 that we did to pick up those copies of Naomi because I don't have a crystal ball and you never know. And I said that four spot, this is one of the probably the biggest writers in comics for the year for 2019, 2020, but definitely in 2020 with those titles for Marvel and has got some creator owned ones still going strong. And we are talking about Sir Cates. We are talking about Megan Hutchinson's husband. Yes, that's right. Mr. Hutchinson. Um, for sure. Uh I think this is another one where people could argue and be like, oh man, if you read, if you're a Venom lover, if you're a Thor guy, I could see you being like, what the hell? Thor, Venom, crossover. What more does this guy need to do? And my only answer is it was a hell of a year in comics. Really, that's it. And it's just a and, great- And Redneck's still great. People don't talk about Redneck, but that's one great people, title. You know what? They don't. Uh, it, it slept on. I also enjoyed Baby Teeth all the way through- uh, I think that Donny Cates, the talk about a tomahawk coming back via a, a Kickstarter. Um, I think that Donny Cates is, is a crazy talented writer who it almost seems funny to say this is almost underrated because as much as people love the things that he does, he still has all these properties that people have yet to be exposed to. Um, but I think they will. There's also was a lot of talk this year about his deal with legendary pictures and the upcoming God country movie. Uh, there's a lot of crossover talk, of course, with his title crossover, as well as where is he going with this? How is this playing into other series? Um, big, big year for, for Donnie Cates. There is no writer whose name uh, gets kind of sales instantly other than Donnie Cates. He's the biggest name writer in the game. Now he's not the number one writer on our list this year. Um, and I expect some people to feel some sort of way about that, but I can defend that argument all day, but he's the biggest name. He's the one who sells books based on his name. Uh, no doubt. Luckily. And thankfully, man, this guy's writing really backs it up. King and black is the event for Marvel and you can give him hell for some of the Marvel. St it's hard, man. Uh, you know, when you're writing for these big twos and you're dealing with these characters that have these long histories, it is really difficult to tell these kind of unique stories, the way that he has crafted in each story arc uh, of any book that he's done, e including Guardians of the Galaxy, which I think was like his like most underrated run that he did for Marvel, um, but uh, incredible. Uh, so I think we're going to be talking Donny Cates yep. annually on this type of list. Yeah, even even the few issues for Doctor Strange he did. Yes, uh, which are now back issue gold, right? So I mean that that shows you the touch this guy has. We are now into the top three, and we would be remiss if we didn't talk about Peach Momoko, lover, hater. I kind of do a little bit of both. I've been vocal about it on here, but 2020, I don't think you can talk about an artist that was more popular for all those covers that she did that were people were seeking left and right. Yeah, and I, this is one, to be honest with you, where even I question where I sit and go, this could be number one. Uh, quite easily. I mean, certainly there were times this year we were saying this was the year of the peach, right? That was the moniker because the, she was dominant. Uh, it, it, there is no artist. It's incomparable. There is no artist whose books get attention the way peaches. Not to mention she's pumping cover out after cover. I mean, one time we even joked amongst each other that her husband was probably helping do some of the covers and you said, you're getting a peach momoko when you're really getting a peep momoko. Right. It's, it's really amazing. Um, in some weeks, she would have three covers released from different publishers. I also applaud the way she worked with every publisher under the sun. I also have to applaud the way that her reputation is untarnished except yeah, no by no one no one could no one talks bad about her except crybaby comic collectors who want to cry about you know everybody wants to be an art critic um which everybody's entitled to their own opinion um but you can it's hard to say something sucks when so many people like it um it's not necessarily my type of art and I think as somebody who has defended peach a lot this year I've gotten kind of this like peach advocate label um but and i'm fine with that um, i said because, some of the covers look like third grade hallway art but yeah you had a couple you had a couple one lines this year <laughs> yeah there's one i remember where you're talking about your your son doing better art in the hallway at school <laughs> and that was probably some of them i really like those some of them i don't that's just me yeah and and some of that comes with the the style that she does and some of it comes with the speed she works in getting out um a lot of her 
her artwork isn't necessarily intricately designed. There's not a whole lot of background and things going on. It's very character driven. Um, and again, it's, it's a style and it's very, very um, also regional because it very much feels like a Japanese kind of art style. That's uh, why I favorite is still style. that Ultimate Comics Ninja Turtle one. Is it, and that's why I will never say Peace Momoko is like a bad artist because like, she has the ability to put a cover out. I don't care who you are. It will be universally liked. Um, I think when you're working at the rate that she's working, uh, you're going to have hits. You're going to have misses. You're putting out a lot of artwork. Yeah. Uh, but it is amazing. I don't, I mean, we, we've been doing this long enough that you and I have seen like the year that Gabrielle Delato was the most dominant. We've seen the year where Adam Hughes, that was the first one I can really remember when people like really didn't start. J. Scott Campbell. J. Scott Campbell. We've watched the year of Jenny Frizen a couple of years ago. Uh, Josh Middleton had a moment um, and people were, but I don't, if you were to compare any of those moments to what we've seen with Peach, it's incomparable. And even the negatives, think about how polarizing, I can't say Peach Momoko without 50% of our audience going, hell yeah, I made some great money off Peach Momoko books. I have some great art that I love to collect. I can't wait to chase that next Peach book. And then we have 50% of our audience who doesn't want to hear about her, thinks it's all a pump and dump game or any other sort of thing. It's, it's, um, it's really incredible. And I've never seen a, a polarizing figure like that who isn't polarizing for say being a jerk or something like that. Like she's just polarizing for just doing her job and, and, and honestly doing it well. I do not expect the, the peach craze to slow down. Uh, we saw exclusive deal coming next year with Marvel there's going to be a lot of Marvel work. And it's interesting, even as she started to like do her Marvel work, these last couple Marvel cover Bs that she's done have been popular. So I think she's going to continue to be popular. And also we've seen her raise the value of uh, non-sports trading cards as her Upper Deck anime set has been like red hot. People have really loved it. If you're not familiar with it, do a little eBay search on that. Incredible. She does the, the, the artwork for all the cards in the base set. Uh, there's autograph cards signed by Peach that do extremely well, um, sketch cards, all kinds of stuff. So that, it's definitely one to check out. But that's an entire card set dedicated to Peach Momoko that came out this year. Hitting us at the number two spot in 2020 was a great year for Star Wars comics. Yeah, <laughs> another one that easily could be number one kind of carried the back issue market for a long time. Um, certainly felt overwhelming to many. Um, as we have sort of talked about, the, the, we, the year started with us talking about, why is nobody buying Star Wars back issues? Well, and, Star- and, 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 and the hype, it branched different phases within the Star Wars verse, right? You had yeah. some pre-Clone Wars, you had some Clone Wars, you had the Kylo Ren mini series. I mean, it was any, anything where Star Wars, we still were talking about how like the Poe Dameron, the Ray, the Finn type stuff is, is still not as well sought after, but everything Star Wars, you know, had a buzz. Bounty Hunters, that series that's come out, that's gotten great yep. traction as well. I mean, it's just... No, Star you're right. Wars, New, is the way. New, new, new publishing with Vader, Bounty, Bounty Hunters, uh, Rise of Kylo Ren, and Dr. Aphra. Um, really everything but the main Star Wars series is, is dominant, um, doing incredibly well. Variant cells doing well. First appearances doing well. And people are getting very proactive with Star Wars first appearances. If there's a first appearance in a Star Wars book, they're grabbing it up. Um, the Dark Horse back issues, you mentioned it, the different eras. You know, the Darth Nihilus, Darth Raven. Uh, Thrawn, uh, Ahsoka, people are getting ahead of the game and really speculating forward. And then the prices, uh, the prices for Ahsoka and Thrawn alone, just staggering. I, I could have, even if you asked me in my wildest dream what they would reach, I never would have projected the, the totals that we're seeing them at. And, uh, and then kind of going forward, now we're seeing the original Star Wars series from Marvel as people get excited for these upcoming shows. Um, and talks about like smaller characters like Wedge and Tilly's getting possibly more of like a uh, spotlight in say like the New Republic show or Jackson uh, getting spotlights. We're seeing like issues five and eight pop from the original Star Wars run. Uh, Issues that you and I talked about like issues two, the first appearance of Han Solo and Chewbacca finally getting attention. Uh, You know, issue 41, the first appearance of Yoda, you know, albeit it's it's not a perfect appearance. 42 may be a 
slightly better. Um, Lando, uh, books, so appearances like that are starting to to creep up, which is awesome. That that was kind of like a long forgotten thing, um, but people are on board, and the m- major reason we have to give it all the credit, I feel like, is John Favreau and the Disney Plus Mandalorian series because that ex- baloney. Yeah, it really exposed people um, to what Star Wars could be. Um, it's, it's, I've heard, uh, you and I talked about this before we got on air. I'm a big fan of the comedian Bill Burr. Um, and he's long criticized Star Wars, not a Star Wars fan, often called it uh, Muppets in Space. And, and then um, he said, you know, when he got cast to be in Star Wars, at first he thought it was kind of like a, a knock on Star Wars fans. He thought it'd be funny. And then he said, as he started working on Mandalorian, he realized that this was this incredible spaghetti Western um, that had, has an, a, a, sh- a style of show like this hasn't been on TV in years. Um, and, and for its popularity to really transcend Star Wars fans, comic fans, um, it, this, this is a show your wife is watching, your kids are watching, um, and it has really taken Star Wars fandom and almost guaranteed that we're going to get another 20 plus years of Star Wars goodness. So I feel like you can feel safe in your Star Wars investments right now. We got, at least in the next two years, we're looking at like five to 10 more shows and movies. Um, there is a lot of reason to be bullish about the Star Wars universe. There's a lot of reason to be excited about Star Wars comics. There's a lot of reason to dig out those first appearances. And I still believe, no matter what you're seeing on the internet, we're living in a pandemic. There are back issue boxes all over this country filled with dark horse Star Wars waiting to get uncovered. Um, I cannot wait till we can get to a point in time with this vaccine and pandemic where we can get out there and dig through those boxes, man, because I'm trying to find some of those books I haven't found yet. Yeah, you're going to see those uh, unicorn finds, right? When that, start ha- right. when that starts happening and people post on Instagram, finding uh, some of these books for, for prices. The only hope that you get the people that sell them for what they are and don't say let me look at those up on ebay first right yeah when you find that clone wars number one variant for 50 bucks <laughs> you know, hope that they don't look up and see what that's going for and we are to our number one spot we talked about donny cates and we said we had a writer that we thought was hotter in 2020 and we have him right here and we have james tynan coming at number one yeah and i love this pick and i love this pick because Oh, shoot, we talked for 20 minutes about it the other night being number one. Bro, we felt like we had to. And 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 I love it because you and I like a little controversy. We love that the Star Wars people are going to be like, no Star Wars. The Ninja Turtles people are going to be like, no Ninja Turtles. The Peace from Moco people are like, no Peace from Moco. And I know you Donnie Cates advocates out there want to see Donnie Cates in that top spot. But here's the reality. Um, I think James Tynan, because of his personality, goes under the radar. He is one of the most humble people in all of comics uh, again i have said this several times please go to ross Ritchie's youtube channel and watch that interview with james tynan you will learn so much about punchline you will learn so much about the writing process that goes in you will get an appreciation for james tynan i mean there's great micro content videos so if you don't want to sit down through like a two-hour interview there's there's great content that can kind of bring you to the topics that you want but james tynan had an incredible year that i don't think people understand um well, I'm going to go property by property, but something's killing the children. Now he didn't launch something's killing the children, but we talk about this all the time. There is a 50% drop off in print run from issue number one to issue number two. And then that 50% continues all the way through issue four until you tend to get your leveling out of your print run. Well, something's killing the children is down in the teens and their print run is double what issue number one was. The only place where we've seen anything like that is The Walking Dead. Uh, This is a unique uh, grassroots, organic kind of growth of a property based on... It should have been killed talking about it pre-FOC. Yeah, it should have been killed. It should have been DOA, right? Never should have gotten off the ground. But it's one of those things. Uh, You know, the market was wrong about that. And anybody who bet against this book was wrong. And now you're not seeing those people. It's funny. The first year that we were talking about this book, uh, there would be people who would be negative, um, who would still say like, oh, it's a high print run. Um, It's an indie book. 
Um, and everybody who jumped on board reading this series really fell in love with the character of Erica Slaughter, as well as kind of the style the book is t- told. It's it's refreshes every four or five issues. You're kind of getting almost a whole new story. Um, not quite anthology style, but o- almost pseudo anthology, which allows you then um, to kind of get jumping on points, which I think was very big for this this series because I think it's a largely why they were able to have people jump on board issues in seven, eight, nine, um, and and again be on the lookout for issue seven, which has a uh, is already a back issue selling well. All of the back issues, by the way, are selling well. All of the late printings are selling well. All of the exclusives are selling well. Issue seven has a preview of another James Wind, uh, James Tinian title, or Tynan title, excuse me, um, Wind, which is one that I think went totally under the radar. Originally supposed to be a graphic novel, was released in monthly comic book form to help support comic book retailers and give them a a title to be excited about coming back from the pandemic, something from James Tynan, uh, something from Boom Studios. And we have heard nothing but good things about Hollywood's perception of Wind and where wind will ultimately end up placing. Do not sleep on wind going forward. Then he releases his his third creator-owned series, which he says in the Ross Ritchie interview, that's what his contract with DC allows for, three creator-owned series at one time. And he does Department of Truth, a conspiracy theory-driven book, part men in black, um, part kind of all these new age conspiracy theories. Awesome book, unique art style, uh, draws you in right off the bat, 150,000 print run on issue one. Just a monster, uh, Image Comics. And, and you see him successful in three different publishers, really kind of being an A player for three different publishers. And finally, the place where he's gotten kind of the most attention is in DC Comics. Uh, there was a lot of talk this year about Tom King's Batman run. A lot of you weren't happy. Um, your complaints were heard, and DC made the shuffle, moved Tom King off, and they brought in James Tynan to make that uh, replacement. And, you know, there were people skeptical. The Batman series had not been doing well. Well, James Tynan came like right off the bat and hit a home run, uh, brought in the Joker war, introduced Punchline. Punchline's a character you and I were skeptical about. And the more we read Punchline, the more we loved the character and realized this is a character not created for cash grab purposes. This is a character created with intention, with a long view. And I tell you what I learned in 2021 or 2020, Brian, I will never doubt a James Tynan created character. I will never, ever say, well, that's a cash grab because after having watched him and listened to him talk about his creative process, I know that he doesn't do anything without intention. There's not a long game uh, being created uh, there. So I, I'm very excited going forward into 2021 um, I have to say, I think his time on Batman will be short-lived. I do think at some point he will move completely creator-owned. He had mentioned that if it wasn't for getting the Batman gig, he probably would have done that in 2020. Um, but I, I think I, I'm fine with that, and the rest of the comic community will be fine with that, judging by the immense quality we got from three titles in 2020 from James Tynan, who really moved comics more uh, across the board in in more more diverse titles and publishers than any other creator in comics. Yeah, I've been excited because I've liked all of them. I know some people, when when would be the one that you'll hear a lot of people say, hey, it wasn't for me. And that's fine because, I mean, I, under, I can understand yeah. that as well. I enjoyed all of them. What I liked about all of them is they all had different types of stories for you to, mm-hmm. to take in. I mean, everyone loves Batman. You know what you're going to get from Batman. But he went back to that Dark Knight style Batman, which I loved. I enjoyed when from that fan, that fantasy type you know spot <laughs> something's killing children don't need to say much there and then of mm-hmm. course you get the whole conspiracy mm-hmm. department of truth and and for him to be able to carry that through all those titles with that high quality it's just it just says volumes for what james tynan we we spoke about that and why we think that's number one you could almost plug and play with donny cates in, in that similar role because i think that's why i like him as much too i mean very diverse writing style uh but yeah, James Tynan's had a hell of a year and looks to carry that through into 2021 for sure. There it is, guys. There's our top 10 back issues for 2020. We say back issues. They're all back issues, but they're kind of like the hot back issue topics for 2020, right? 
Yeah, def- oh, definitely. Uh, they, these were the ones that we felt like everyone was talking about. Of course, we want to hear what you guys think in the comments section. What were your, what's your top 10? What are some top picks? Um, what did you feel like people were buzzing about in, in 2020? On top of that, I want to know what you guys are thinking is going to happen, the trends in 2021. That's something Brian and I have been talking about just amongst ourselves. We Like we said, we think these licensed properties are going to continue to go forward. I would look at, at properties like Thundercats and, and uh, Transformers uh, to be kind of like that next uh, generation that gets some level of attention. Um, I think that we're going to see a lot of movement from Image Comics continuing to go forward. I think more creators are going to make that in, in independent jump. Um, and I think Image Comics and Skybound Comics are definitely specifically uh, going to be brands on, on the rise. Um, I, I definitely think that uh, DC Comics is the most undervalued first appearance kind of like collection across the board. If you look at what these Marvel books are doing with Disney Plus, if HBO Max can get Disney Plus sort of momentum going, uh, then there's a lot of room on on the DC table. And I really am hopeful to see Milestone make some progress in 2021. Yeah, I think, I mean, five years ago, we were talking about how uh, undervalued we thought DC Silver Age keys were. I think that's the same trend right now, but I think that's also moving into a lot of that DC Bronze Age that... um, Oh yeah, B B and C type characters. We saw what Marvel did with Iron Man, so it'd be anxious to see what happens with DC and HBO Max, just as you said. But with that being said, guys, want to wish each and every guys a merry, merry Christmas, happy New Year. We will have brand new content starting in January of 2021. We're going to take some time off to spend time with our families. Hope you guys do the same. Be safe. We'll see you in 2021. Oh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way.